Hey, this is uh, TJ Scott, and I'm listening to Chris Gordon's Rambling on Hellblazers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, Hellblazers, wherever you may be in the world, and not just Hellblazers. I welcome fans of Xena, Gotham, Spartacus, and whoever else may be listening to my little, humble little podcast. Thank you very much for joining me, and for listening, and your support. Uh, today I bring to you something special. This is a special guest who has got a very strong directorial history within the TV and film industry, and... He is no stranger to the many of the fans who will be listening and all over Twitter. He is currently celebrating the release of his indie film Death Valley, which is released across the United States today, saw its premiere on Friday night. So, without further ado, I shall introduce you to the director, T.J. Scott. Okay, so everyone, I've got T.J. with me here, T.J. Scott, um, director from... A saint of last resorts, as well as many, many other things. Uh, so, hey, TJ, how are you? Uh, great, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, no, thank you. Really, really appreciate you uh, taking time out to come on today. It's absolutely fantastic to have you here. Cool. It's a, it's a, it's a fun day for me, actually, because uh, uh, my uh, feature film, Death Valley, uh, starts airing today. So, uh it's a good day. We're excited. Yay. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. I was actually watching the trailer for that before, and it looked really good. Um, you know, not being sycophantic, it actually it does look really good. <laughs> so tell me more about yeah. Tell me more about the film well, then. Well, yeah, the the premiere was um, um, this Saturday, and it was kind of fun because uh, Angelica was there, okay. and um, um, Dave Glass, who's the production designer, was there. So and uh, Hillary worked on the project. So it was actually a little Constantine reunion on the red carpet. It was nice. fantastic. <laughs> and we were talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. <laughs> the carpet I, of our premiere, so there you go. Oh, no, you've thrown me again now, thanks. <laughs> That's just absolutely amazing. But no, it's, it's great to have a Constantine reunion. As it seems to be such a friendly family environment on that on that set, which uh, everyone seems to have said. So it's good that you can get back and meet, meet up again. <laughs> It was really good. And actually, that yeah, happened to be uh, just completely uh, um, you know, on, a, on a different tangent. I was uh, texting back and forth with Matt because I wanted to see him in Broadway. Oh. So uh, I, I'm going to go uh, see Matt Ryan in his show on Broadway uh, in two weeks. So I was trying to arrange some tickets. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, I went to see John Jano. A couple of the uh, Hellblazer community have gone to see Matt recently in his play in New York. So it was absolutely fantastic. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I got to see John Joe a couple of weeks ago as well in uh, the Crucible over in Manchester oh, in the UK. Yeah, that was fun. That was really, really interesting. Very, very deep play, um, but very good. So, tell me about your new film, then, TJ. I'll, I'll <laughs> plug away before I go into the questions from the first. Oh, thanks, thanks for playing. <laughs> uh, okay, we love it. It's, it's just got released in North America. I don't know uh, if it's available in England yet, but it will be shortly. Um, it's a really cool little uh, noir road thriller. Kind of what I wanted to do was just like a, a tiny little movie with really four half in it and uh, a tiny crew of four people. And we shot it in Death Valley, which is the most one of the most arid places on Earth. There's not one stitch of greenery. Uh, but it's also my favorite place on Earth. And, and uh, it's just a little sort of hoot noir acting movie. Just no special effects, no stunts, just actors acting, but really strong performances, and uh, Katrina Law and Nick Terrape from Spartacus, I don't know if there's a Spartacus, yep. or Victoria Pratt, and uh, Lachlan Monroe, who's been in the Wayne's Brother movie, and then uh, uh, Kelly Hu, uh, starring in it, and uh, no, she's, I'm totally never in it, Scorpion oh, King okay. and X-Men, yeah. and, and uh, uh, Jeremy Ratchford from Cold Space series. Cool. So, uh, very, very fun little movie, and uh, please download it and watch it. Hashtag Death Valley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the end of the promo for my... Uh, <laughs> get back to Constantine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that's cool. No worries. Um, yeah, it does, I say, I've, I watched the trailer just beforehand, uh, and it does really look like a cool film. That's like massive, very suspenseful, and uh, yeah, it looked good <laughs> from what I saw. Ooh. Can't wait for it to come out over here. Um, so hurry up and get it over here. <laughs> Team, uh, it seemed to do well. People really liked it at the premiere. So, uh, and it's getting, uh, actually getting really, really good reviews. That's really kind good. Of, 
like, you know, my parents probably wrote the reviews. They're so good. Uh, <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> so, by the way, Cool. Okay, so I've got, a, as you know, I've got a few questions here from Franz. I actually went, oops, I've disappeared. Uh, went to the different fandoms, because obviously with your extensive directorial history, <laughs> uh, I decided to go quite a lot way to all the different fandoms as well. So it's not just Constantine ones I've actually got ended up here. I've got ones from Xena as well, uh, and, and areas like that, which is obviously uh, quite a way back, back in 95. But that seems to be still very strong, and people do remember you from there as well. So the first ones I do have for Constantine, these are from a lady called Mimi, who's out in Japan, who's a big Constantine fan. The first one was, what was the most challenging scene to Constantine, episode 8? Oh, oddly enough, I mean, it's, you know, we did some pretty big shots in the show, but oddly enough, there's uh, a little thing where we had to burn some stuff on a table in like a little bit of a seance thing, <laughs> and actually lighting stuff on fire, having the actors put it out on camera, and uh, it was just kind of dangerous, and it was weird, and it was like the littlest scene that you never think about is going to be the most difficult one to shoot, and then uh, it ended up that the, the boys were great with it, and uh, but it was it was a bit of a challenge, that just this, these candles that had to light up and glow and stuff uh, within the episode. Uh, sometimes the simplest things are the most difficult because you don't think about them until the last second. And when you're doing, you know, the big shots, you, we all think about it and plan it out. When it's like candles lighting and going out, a little bit of flame, you don't really think of it. Anyway, that was it. <laughs> cool. We also had one other really tricky one. Uh, in this episode, if you remember, there's some fruit that uh, sort of cries blood. They, you know, they go mm-hmm. to... Uh, they go to uh, the, the Mexican guy's house, and outside are these trees, and they're trying to dig up the placenta uh, of the baby underneath the tree, and all of a sudden the, the fruit starts to dry. And, and little drips of blood are hard to film, so uh, getting the backlight in and a big scene, and getting fruit to drip blood, we had to run a separate little bloodline to each of these little pieces of fruit. Uh, it was kind of tricky, so uh, we probably spent three hours doing two shots there and had to scrap all the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's amazing when you see so many, I say so much little details can take so much time and so much effort to actually do for just a couple of seconds or 30 seconds or 60 seconds on a screen. But, then, but in a show like Constantine, it's actually those tiny little things that uh, defy reality. Mm-hmm. that you need to spend your time on. Because, you know, reality is reality. This world is sort of an altered reality. So that's what you've got to make cool. It's like, you know, he's, he's got his foot in another world almost. So, you know, where for bleeds and stuff. So, yeah. uh, and, and candles explode. So you need, you need to spend your time on those things to make sure that they're right. All right, cool. No problem. Okay, so thanks for that one, TJ. The next question I've got, again, it's from Mimi, which was, what has been the most memorable thing about working with all of those talented actors within Constantine? You know, I just... Uh, there's an interesting thing when you're blocking a scene where some directors like to just tell actors where to go. Mm-hmm. I really like to collaborate with actors and go, where do you think you want to go in this scene? And so I kind of stand back where I think I want the camera to be, and I like to say... You know, if this is your stage, why don't you run the scene? And my favorite thing is the collaboration with actors. And these actors, uh, you know, Matt and Angelica and Charles uh, and Claire, who is our guest star in the episode, mm-hmm. uh, Claire uh, Vanderbilt, were so giving. I just kind of loved watching them figure out where they thought they should be in the scene. Because quite often Matt would go, no, 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 you should be standing in front of me here. You know, we're normally the way we block things is number one of the call sheets, kind of closest to the camera, and it it works around number one. But Matt was so often, no, 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 this is your scene. I'm going to stand in the back, and you get in the front. And uh, that was kind of, you know, what I really took away and had a fun time with uh, on that show was was how well uh, they worked together and really how much they embraced the guest star. There's often a thing that guest stars will tell you that they have a show and uh, you're coming into someone else's family there. And everybody else knows each other and they know the inside 
inside jokes and everything. And quite often, even though you're welcome, you're on the outside. But these yeah. guys really took Claire uh, in, you know, and, and made her part of the team. So she felt like there since day one, even though, you know, she was a guest part in the episode. Uh, and that was so good at that. And that all comes down to number one, two, and three on the call sheet, welcoming uh, the other cast in. And, and they were just fantastic at it. So uh, I really love that for that show. All right, cool. Really interesting. Again, it's something I've heard about Matt from other people as well, is how he was very um, giving in you know, helping the others and, and like you just said, in assisting others and moving them around, so not taking the limelight as you know, the number one, like you say, and, and moving around and obviously sharing all that with everybody. I so, think part of that might be his you know, theatre background, mm-hmm. uh, where you know, in theatre it's more of always a community and you know, you're, you spend so many hours together that you become a family. Yeah. Uh, and I think Matt likes that part of it. I think he really liked that, you know, it was film family and trying to make it as much of a family on set. You know, he really knew every crew member, uh, you know, by name and about them. So, mm-hmm. so in the mornings, you can come in and welcome everybody. Uh, even play you do in theater. So, uh, you know, maybe it's the theater background. <laughs> well, yeah, it could be. Um... You know, obviously Matt's very extensive with his theatre in the Royal Shakespeare Company as well. So yeah, it could could be that. <laughs> it's what well, it definitely made I think for everyone to f- feel more comfortable on set. Anyway, from what I've gathered from the people I've spoken to, and from what yeah. could be seen throughout the screen from as a viewer, yeah. um, definitely. Okay, next question comes from Japan as well. And apologies, I've got to get this name right. It's Hiroshi Miki, I believe. Um, and it basically says, where does your inspiration on beautiful images come from? Because he recognises you from the blue, yellow lightning and your theatrical productions with smoke and the characteristic layouts. It's very, very uh, individual. Um, so I'd just like to know where that comes from. I, I, I do like my uh, beautiful pictures. I like to um, create images that help to tell the story. Um, and, and then put the action, you know, in, in front of them. Try and support their story as well as we can with, with beautiful images that also tell the story. Uh, I am a photographer too. That's kind of my other uh, sideline, my other passion. So I really do think in terms of pictures, my brain just kind of works that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I figure the actors are going to provide the performance and stuff, but that give them some good support with beautiful pictures to. Uh, so that's sort of that comes from, and I work very closely with the director of photography that I shoot with. Excellent. And I really enjoy that part of the collaboration of creating the image. Awesome, that's great. That actually brings me into another question here, which is um, from Kibo, and that's to ask you about the In the Tub book that you've done. And I've seen it, and I've seen some of the images, which is, that, you know, and also all the proceeds go towards breast cancer for that. And the photography in there is absolutely stunning. Um, not to mention the, the content of the, the, the way it was actually portrayed um, but it was very very beautifully done and I think it was a really really good visual way to actually you know to support something as important as the, the breast cancer theme uh, can you talk us about through that book how did you come up with that idea and yeah, just if people haven't heard about it, I'll do my little uh, shameless pitch here. Sure. Uh, which, which is, uh, in the tub is uh, a portrait of actors, recording artists, models. All you need in the bathtub is a common setting, and then all the profits go to breast cancer research. And um, one in seven women in North America, and I think probably most, most places, are affected by breast cancer in some way at some point in their lives. Uh, it runs deeply in my family. My mother passed away from it. My grandmother did. My sisters have uh, had. Um, so my mother, who was uh, a nurse at a very high level nurse who ran a lot of campaigns about anti-smoking and stuff, said, "You know, it's just a matter of research money until we figure this out." Because in her time, they used to have tuberculosis, and then that was gone. And they had polio. They found a vaccine. She just got to keep throwing money at it. So. I figured the one thing I know how to do, I don't know how to solve breast cancer, but I know how to take nice pictures. Yeah. So I co opted all of my friends <laughs> to uh, jump in the tub nude and take photos of them. And uh, you will find that I'm now shooting volume two of the book. The book's available on Amazon. You can uh, buy it. I yeah. pay all the profits for breast cancer research. Uh, and uh, Angelica will be in volume two. All right, uh, cool. 
Yeah, she uh, stripped down and jumping. She's a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> So well, if you look at Africa, <laughs> of course. Cool. Well, Sam, I'm, I'm not surprised that people will be jumping to actually be in the book, um, considering you know the uh, the emotion and the and the reasoning for it. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic piece. I say, f- using your skills and your skill sets to actually try and help with the cause to, to get that cure, which we all desperately want. Yeah, and it's, it's a fun collaboration for me because. For the first volume of the book, I shot 135 people. And actually, I shot most of my actor, actress friends that I knew, recording artists, you know, that were... Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so volume two, it's all been people handing off other people. So I often people shop and I meet them for the very first time and then uh, jump in the job, what you do. But it forms kind of a, a lifelong friendship with these people. Uh, and a lot of these people that I shot on, uh, or in the tub have become really close friends and were on the red carpet for the NFL uh, this week, so it was very cool. That's really, really cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, moving. I've got some questions now from Kim uh, at Kim Maville. Uh, she's on, obviously on Twitter. Who or what made you want to become a director in the first place? Well, I, uh, it's interesting. I started out as an actor when I was eight years old because I just loved movie and cinema and uh you know just as a kid i would watch yeah. the stuff and go, wow uh, i, I want to be doing that i want to be i thought an actor is the only way to become it right in canada uh and then you know when i was about 17 years old i've been working in the business quite a while i watched uh truffaut's movie day for night mm-hmm. uh and it's about a movie within a movie and francois truffaut wrote it, but also plays the director within the movie. Right, okay. Ah, you know what? That's what I actually want to do. And I was that guy who would always spend all his time on set when I was a kid, finding out, you know, about uh, cinematography and props and everything. Uh, I, I guess I was a okay kid, so they let me walk around on set all day when I wasn't filming. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all of a sudden I said, uh, that's what I do, and I went back to film school. And... Um, uh, Film school at the time, I don't know if I've learned that much about directing, but what film school does is it makes you direct. Mm-hmm. At that time, a little bit before digital cameras and stuff, we actually had to shoot on film, so you had to go to film school to get the equipment. Okay. Uh, but doing it, or actually having to do the first assignments, made me realize I could, uh, and that kind of grew from there. So uh, I think it really just goes back to True Flow's movie. Uh, day for night. If people have seen it, it's an obscure movie, but you can get it on DVD and there's a bright cherry version of it. And, uh, uh, in French, it's called La Nuit Americaine. Fantastic movie. All right, cool. Keep an eye out for that. Um, it's a nice, interesting uh, way to start your career off as well. So it's a very early, a little child actor then, <laughs> aged from eight yeah. onwards. Cool. I kind of grew up on film sets and, and just. Uh, that I, you know, that was one place I always felt at home. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, what were your favorite movies? Or what are your favorite movies, should I say? What kind of genre? Uh, you know what? I really like them. I like big, epic period pieces. Uh, and they don't make a lot of them anymore. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so really, the, the lean type uh, movies are what I, uh, I like. Huge, epic. And I also like True stories, things that are, um, movies that are, um, try to, you know, the spirit of a person conquering things uh, uh-huh. is, is, is my favorite things. Uh, even like a Braveheart type movie um, uh, is what I really, really like. Yeah. But big epic period pieces. Anything with that, I'll sit and watch, even if it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, there's some, there is something about the big epics. So they just burst out regardless. Even some you know, really old classics that you've got as well. They just spring out at you. Um, ageless or timeless, should I say. <laughs> cool. what, yeah. who, who are your favourite actors? Oh, Do you want to say that? Like, everyone you've worked with. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. Uh, I love actors. You know, I just... Because I grew up that uh, acting and I realized, you know, how difficult it is, mm-hmm. uh, I feel for actors. Like, how difficult it is even to get the parts, you know, the auditioning, yeah. the 
Ah, not the part when you've actually got the part, but the sitting around waiting, memorizing lines mm -hmm. for roles that you never get. I just feel this uh, akin spirit to any actor, so uh, I don't have favorites. <laughs> I, I like the one I'm working with at the time. <laughs> Fair enough. Diplomatic answer. <laughs> cool. Is there any particular subject you'd like to be made into a movie or a TV series? Ooh. I... I uh, I've developed a, a thing about the Shelby Cobra race car, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a right stuff on wheels type story. And I would actually love to actually get that movie made at some point. It's it's a it's kind of cool subject matter, not just because I wrote it, but I, I spent the time writing it because I do love the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And the the story is uh, about a guy who was at the top of his game at. 35 years old. He was like one of the best race car drivers in the world. And he right. had a bad heart. And uh, they banned him from racing. Oh. And he hadn't really made any money because he didn't really make money even though he was on the cover of magazines and stuff at that time. And uh, Ferrari said, look, you haven't been banned from racing in Italy. Come over to Italy and, and race for me. And uh, he went there and he realized that Ferrari was just a total prick to his drivers. And he had this epiphany. He decided that he would build a race car. Okay. And he told, he told Ferrari, he said, I'm going to come back and kick your ass. And Ferrari, you know, no, <laughs> never made a race car that's any good. And you're certainly not going to make one. And uh, with a year, he built uh, a race car. A tiny little group of 20-year-old right stuff guys in a garage in Venice Beach, California. And came back and won the world championship and beat Ferrari. Uh, wow. Just by stealing, cajoling, glad handing. I mean, this this guy, Charles Shelby, uh, was just a, a guy who could, uh, you know, talk, talk you uh, into anything. Uh, and it's a fantastic <laughs> story. But it's, you know, the stuff, I like those triumph of the spirit things. Awesome. That sounds great. I reckon that'll be a good movie to have. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love the Shelby GT500. It's got to be one of my favorite cars. Probably many thousands or millions of people, but it's an absolutely beautiful car. That is, really is. I will own one one day. <laughs> uh, I actually had uh, uh, five. Well, Carol Shelby's passed away now, but while he was uh, alive, I interviewed him for this movie while I was writing it. And I spent about three days in his house. Wow. And, uh, and then I got to go to the factory and see all the original Cobras and stuff. Wow. So it was, it was a fun world to dive into. Oh. What day do you think? <laughs> I can imagine. I actually went for a uh, sideline. I went for an interview with Bentley uh, several years back, and I got taken around the Bentley factory, uh, oh. and my jaw was on the floor because they were just turning around and said, that, you know, that car over there, it starts at like $500,000. That's the, you know, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that car is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful cars. Okay. So this is from Wolf, Autumn Wolf on Twitter. What's the best part of, sorry, what's the part of being involved in the movie industry that you've enjoyed the most? Kind of mixes in with some of what we've already said, but. You know, a lot of it's meeting people. I, what I really enjoy about it is um, being on the road and discovering a place, a city, a country, through the people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that. Like, I've shot in France, and I've seen parts of France in Paris that people would never see. It's where the tourists don't go. Yeah. You know, I've been in Cape Town and been to the richest parts of Cape Town and, you know, multi-billion dollar houses with infinity pools that you would never be invited into, you know, if you're a tourist. And then I've shot in the worst areas where we needed to go in with armed guards. <laughs> uh, and and that's kind of the fun of it for me is traveling all around the world and being a tourist, but being a tourist with locals in a way that you would never get to see that world. So uh, it's a different way of uh, seeing the world. All right, cool. Sounds a great way traveling the world and seeing it in the in a different light. That's great. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, there's very. Quite a lot of parts of Paris, actually. I'm trying to think, uh, which <laughs> tourists wouldn't really want to go to. <laughs> well, what it is is it takes you where you film is not where tourists normally are. Mm. You know, you don't shoot from uh, the Triomphe. Really, I mean, you might get a shot, but that's not really where a movie's going to take place. It's yeah. In little neighborhoods and stuff. That's cool. I, I was just shooting Gotham in New York, uh, and you know, 
we ended up shooting at Harlem and East Harlem and Brooklyn, all these places that I've awesome. heard about all my life. And uh, yeah. it's just so much fun to go and shoot there. Uh, create a world of Gotham within New York. That, that just m- must be absolutely awesome. Uh, <laughs> Gotham's another fantastic series, by the way. It's just, I say to. I didn't realise actually shot on location in New York as well. That's <laughs> atmospheric even more so. Um, which actually brings another <laughs> nicely round to another one from Autumn Wolf. Was was it hard to direct shows like Gotham, uh, who come with cert- which come with certain expectations due to their comic origins? It, you know, it is kind of interesting because people that are super fans of stuff really watch when you change things and don't stick to you know the original story, mm-hmm. but. And sometimes it change things, so it's kind of fun to uh, see what people jump on you for and say, "No, that's not about well, the graphic novel. What are you doing? That's not what that character looks like." But you know, <laughs> we try as much as possible to yeah. be fans, uh, you know, to be graphic novel fans ourselves, and because we all are, we wouldn't be working on these projects. And uh, you know, we we try and cast people who sort of look like the characters and stuff. But it is funny to see when. But we do stray and jump on us for it. <laughs> but uh, there are difficulties in it. Uh, but it's also really cool, too. I remember on um, uh, Gotham, I had, to do, um, I had to do one image that I didn't understand was, was uh, a, a really well-known image within the Gotham world. Yeah. Uh, and the, the gates to Arkham Asylum. Right. I had this other thing in my mind, and then... It was funny that the production designer just carefully came up to me once and he showed like four different versions from different graphic novels <laughs> of what the gates looked like. He said, uh-huh. this is what people are expecting. And I went, yeah, you're right. Okay. I, I had strayed. I had strayed. And he was like, sometimes you need someone else on the production to go, no, we got to give actually that's what the gates need to look like because that's what's imprinted in everyone's head. So we went back and we created exactly what was in the graphic novel for the gates. <laughs> The case of uh, Arkham Asylum. Awesome. So, it, 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 the whole team's behind it and get, you know, that it's a yeah. novel and they're watching this so we uh, even can't stray too far. God, that's really good to hear as well that, you know, everyone's so sort of, everyone is involved and everyone's taking, taking conscious effort of who the, you know, who the viewers are going to be um, for the show. Okay, what was your most, this is another one from Autumn Wolf's last one, what was your most memorable fan encounter? Or memorable fan encounter, if I put it right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, you know, really, the, the time where I really had a lot of fan encounter is at the Xena conventions. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and and it, it's really fun because I was, Xena was very close to my heart. Uh, I was kind of a producer and director on that show and directed a lot of the earlier episodes. And, and it's fun that years later, people are still very passionate about that show. Uh, and, and I love when people come up and mentioned things about an episode that I had even completely forgotten, but they're still entrenched in the show. So <laughs> yeah. I think back to just being at the Zeta conventions and having everyone on a show that I had a long time ago in terms of filming, but it's still alive in people's hearts is, is uh, my favorite thing. Excellent. Excellent. That actually brings me perfectly, perfectly around the corner to a vegan girl who is from Twitter. And she wants to know, is there any chance that you and Victoria Pratt would make future appearances at Xena conventions? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be good, gal. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Victoria does them a lot. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll show up when she's there. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely a possibility. It's funny. Every year, is final. it's the last Xena convention we're doing. You know, that's what the, they announced. And of course, next year it's, uh, it does well, so there's another one. So uh, it'll keep going forever. So, so. Oh, yeah, I definitely think they'll carry on and on and on. Xena is just uh, outstanding in its uh, popularity, like you said. Okay, and how, sec, second, sorry? Well, you know what was fun about that show was uh, I was directing on the series, uh, and they said there's a spin off And mm-hmm. it was a tiny show. Shot it for like nothing when it started. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, it was press service budget of a normal uh, CSI type. Uh, uh, but it was just, it was Hart. It was Hart and Lucy and Renee, Lucy Loves and uh, Renee O'Connor were so charismatic and interesting to watch 
that no one at first noticed that we were making it with no, you know, minimal production value and minimal money. Uh, uh, and then it gained popularity, and then we got bigger budgets. But it was just fun that it just started super, super small. And I really wanted on it because I thought it was so interesting. So I actually mm -hmm. needed to, to, you know, let me get some time off unfortunately, and jump over to the other show that was shooting with the same production company. <laughs> So, it, that show was all about heart and passion. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it still has all that heart and passion. Uh, Vegan Gal, second question is, what was your most memorable moment while directing episodes of Xena? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know what? I think I know exactly what that was. was uh, we were doing an episode where, uh, where Lucy got to bite into uh, Renee O'Connor's neck. And mm -hmm. I said... We just played out a little bit like there was a little sexual intrigue going on yep. here, and that there was uh, maybe more of this relationship than uh, we uh, anticipated <laughs> earlier. Just play that maybe there's an intrigue between the two of you, mm -hmm. and uh, we get and uh, the audience caught on, and that was the beginning of the fact that there might be a lesbian relationship there, and in the Series they never said it was was always just kind of played uh, just under the surface. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're not, but early on we just feathered it in there and hid it in there. I wanted to create a character that was an iconically gay character, even though we never really said because at the time people didn't, uh, and that it wasn't in the script. We just kind of started to work mm -hmm. in the storyline. Suppose. All right, cool. Very subtle. That was <laughs> my new right way what we've done. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I remember those kinds of episodes as well when I was watching Xena, and you did have that feeling in you, so yeah, it was uh, very, very subtly and well done. <laughs> okay, next one is from Celia Robin, uh, who's also asking from Xena. She wants to know how you feel about having a couple of your episodes listed in the Whoosh Top 12. <laughs> Which is the Xena. Ooh, I, I, <laughs> I, you know what? There's so many good episodes of that show, and I watched it as a fan, too. Uh, uh, I only work on shows that I really like, too, so, you know, that I would like to work on. Um, so, uh, uh, that's fun. And I, I think it was Kalisto I was like, yeah, or, uh, yeah. I, I don't know which one's in, but uh, it's fun. It's great. Love it. <laughs> cool. Okay, did filming in New Zealand, this is also from Celia, did filming in New Zealand give you an otherworldliness to the feel of the show? You know, it totally did. We we shot out on these famous beaches in New Zealand and on what we called film farms. And they would they would rent these farms, like paddocks and farms, and build the set. And because we had a, a first unit, a second unit, we would jump back and forth between these sets all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd go out to a film farm and you'd go, oh, there's a little roadway with you know houses, and then we'd build a castle out in the middle of another field, and <laughs> then we'd go out to beaches. So it really was, we were doing medieval, uh, you know, dropped into a medieval world, and you would show up on set, and everyone's already dressed up medieval, so it really did feel like we'd walk into a different world every time we were out there. Fantastic. I can just picture it now. It sounds great. Um, would you like to see a reboot, and would you be interested in directing a reboot if there were to be one? <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, any, anything that's like uh, very close to my heart, that show. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'd love to see a reboot. Uh, I'd love to see what they did with Lucy and Renee. You know, they probably can play those two characters, or maybe they are, but, you know, passing on the baton. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would be cool. Of course, I'd love to direct it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay, next, TJ has asked uh, You directed Xena. Would you like to rework with Lucy and Bruce Campbell for Ash vs. the Evil Dead? <laughs> <laughs> I was asked to do uh, uh, an Ash, uh, and it wasn't available, which is too bad. Um, uh. So, uh, uh, But I have worked with Lucy again. I, I worked with Frank Spartacus, so that yeah. was really cool. And you know what? I actually never directed Bruce, even though he was in uh, Xena. He did all the comedic episodes, mm -hmm. and I always stuck to the dark episodes because we knew what episodes were coming up. To the darker, give me the darker ones. <laughs> so Bruce and I, we would with Matt would see each other, but I actually mm -hmm. never directed him. So all fun. right, cool. Didn't know. Didn't realize that. Uh, 
Okay, out this again from TJ. Out of all the pilots and shows you've directed, which is your favourite show out of it all? I guess you kind of alluded to that there straight away in the past 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> I think yeah, I can guess. I, I, I can't have a favourite. <laughs> I can't have a favourite. I love all the shows. I only, you know, I like it. I don't yeah. find anything. I don't uh, enjoy and they're, they're all fun and everything has its own uh, merits and for me. Um, every show is a fun collaboration. Cool. Okay, you've directed uh, two, do- two shows from DC, Gotham and Constantine. Would you like to oh, just answer that as well? Would you like to direct more with that tone of darkness within it? Um, it seems like, obviously, from the last answer, that you like that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah, I certainly. You know, I, I kind of gravitate towards things that are a little bit dark. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those directors that loves comedies, but I'm never going to direct a comedy because mm-hmm. if it's not dark enough, I can make a show dark. If it's you know, if it has enough action, I can create the action. If it's you know, if it's not sexy enough, I can do that. it's not funny. I don't know how to make it funny. So, uh, <laughs> that, that's a different talent. So I would definitely stick to the darker shows. And uh, I do love the DC darkness. Awesome. Yeah, some loads of shows you could do in DC. Uh, well, and the, 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 the people at DC are great, too. You know, they're, they're so supportive of the mm-hmm. filmmakers. Uh, they were great. Well, I was doing Constantine. Hell, uh, Hellblazer's not really a graphic novel that I knew well. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, I do my research as soon as I come on and I'm reading stuff, but uh, I would write them or call them all the time to say, what's, what's this? What am, I, what am I missing here? What's the, the storyline behind this? Is, yeah. is is there something I haven't read about this? And they were great about filling us in and giving us the storyline and, the, you know, this graphic novel and it jumps and something comes up here. They were really, they're great people to, to collaborate with. Awesome, excellent. Uh, okay, so moving on to oh, sadly, I think they're my last two questions. I'm just going to check just in case one's just come through. I think. <laughs> uh, bear with me a second. It would have done if I don't press things right. Nope. Okay, so the last two questions then, sadly, TJ, are what show gave you the most challenging storyline and why? Hmm. One of the most challenging things I think has been Orphan Black, and uh, I don't know if you've seen Orphan Black, but the lead character plays seven. The lead actress plays seven different characters. Uh, really, I think she's up to thirteen different ones, but there's seven main ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part of the, the challenging part of it is that you got an actress playing all the different roles. Was uh, you know how to structure a storyline and film where she's such a different character in, in each of the times you shoot her and sometimes she's playing three characters in one scene. Uh, there was an episode where she played four characters in one scene. Uh, so that's certainly a, a challenge from a storyline but like as mm-hmm. a direct uh, you know work with it but a fantastic challenge to uh, and touch Animus Lanny who's the actress who plays all these characters really does all the heavy lifting uh, on the show as far as yeah. figuring that out. She will find the characters are different. Uh, that was certainly a challenge to figure out how to shoot someone who's three characters in the same scene. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, that could be really. Uh, that makes it interesting though when it's a good challenge like that. Uh, it's, uh, you, I always wonder when I sit and watch and you, you know some of the you know some of the films where where that happens. I think. And you just wonder how it's done. I mean, Eddie Murphy seems to play a lot where he's the same. And the Nutty Professor, yeah. for, you know, those kind of trading. Yeah. yeah you, you, you just, as a somewhat, you, yeah, you, it's great that you can explain how, what of a challenge it is because when you're watching it, you just sit there and think, holy cow, that must be so hard to work <laughs> for everyone involved to actually picture and get that right. I mean, really on the exact opposite side of the spectrum. So uh, or- Orphan Black's all about minutia. How, how do you mm-hmm. get you? small enough, a little detail. And the show that I was doing at the pretty much if I wasn't doing Orphan Black, I was doing Spartacus at the same yeah. time. And Spartacus was all about how to make it bigger. Mm-hmm. And I did an episode where uh, if you watch the show, um, Spartacus separates from Crixus, who's kind of the number two on the call yeah. sheet guy. And Crixus goes into a battle and he's got five thousand people. He goes into a battle with another uh, group of five thousand people. And then a group of 10,000 shows up. Mm. So it's like, you read that, you're like, oh, OK, 
okay, well, how am I going to do that? <laughs> so that, that's the opposite side of the spectrum. Is, uh, you know, how do I have a battle with 5,000, 5,000, 10,000? So, uh, on that particular one, I came up with this idea of having huge flaming fireballs come down into the middle of the, the, the field where they're fighting. Cool. And it was kind of a cool spectacle, but what it was doing in a directorial way was creating something that blocked all the backgrounds that you never saw that there wasn't oh. background people. Yeah. You just have, oh, fire, huge fireballs behind them uh, that they're now fighting between. And uh -huh. really, what was my ploy to uh, not have to have so many people in the back. Like, <laughs> I heard people in each shot, but I couldn't have 5,000. So oh, yeah. That, that was a fun way of coping with that challenge. <laughs> Fantastic. Spartacus was another... I oh, absolutely loved Spartacus, by the way. It was an absolutely amazing series, series and show. It, it favoured one of my... Uh, one of my phrases for many years of Jupiter's cock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotcha. There was a lot of Jupiter's cock. <laughs> there was. There was a lot of that. I, was just, I remember I just killed myself laughing the first time I heard that. It was just... <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, 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 <laughs> even the night one, I'm sure even came up with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it became part of my vocabulary for quite a while afterwards because I loved it that much. So. <laughs> Yeah, fine. Yeah, cool. Um, the last one from Tracy. There are, there's one more as well from someone else. But the last one from Tracy is, what would be your theme song? <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, question. To you. I don't even know. I, I can't even think of what it is. You know, you know what it really is? It's probably like uh, the theme from Born Identity, which, mm -hmm. which is a song, but it's just like a go, go, go face. And that's the way I like to go. It's like, I just like the, just, just go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. Never take a break. Yeah. Um, blah, 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 you know, blast along. Uh, that's, that's my theme song. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Cool. Um, I think she might be putting a request into the Hellblazer DJ who does uh, music for the Hellblazer fandom and stuff like that. So that's probably why she, I think she'll be passing that along. Okay. The last question I've got is from Lady Lickets or Likets, who's called Teresa from, this is a Xena Barry Storm. Uh, this one's just come in. So, as a Xena fan, is there any way they could raise money to find a Xena revival? And do you have any idea of how to bring Xena back from the dead? <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, Lucy, Lucy's working very hard at Rob Tappert on reviving the uh, show. So, but, you know, it just takes a ton of money. That's not the type of show they're going to do for, you know, no money at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, that's not something I'm going to on uh, Kickstarter for. Um, they really need to get the network to find that to raise the money to do it. But uh, I, I think they're working very avidly on it. I, I'd not be surprised all the next year if uh, that show came back. All right, cool. No worries. They've also, she also asks, can they, can they, as in the fans, please write an, an episode that states Xena was just dreaming and Gabby wakes her up and they never go to Chin or China, is it? <laughs> <laughs> You can write whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens. Ah, <laughs> oh, fair enough. That's cool. Uh, that does actually bring me right to the very end of all my questions, TJ. Um, sadly. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. It has, yeah, definitely. Have you got anything you'd like to say to any of your fans out there, regardless of which genre, whether it's the Xena, Constantine, or Gotham, any? <laughs> No, just uh, keep watching the shows. We, we love when, uh, you know, fans uh, you know, follow us uh, on Twitter and, uh, you know, and ask questions and stuff. Uh, I'm doing some live tweeting on Gotham. Uh, and definitely, if you get a chance, you can, you know, download Death Valley. Uh, um, you know, tweet about it once you've seen it, if you like it. And uh, look up in the on Amazon. More shameless self-promotion, but you know what? <laughs> that's, that's how we sell things. Little uh, Death Valley's like a tiny little indie movie, uh, financed out of our own pockets, and uh, our advertising campaign is purely just on uh, Facebook and Twitter. So here we are. Hey, you're giving you, what an hour of your time up to speak to me, so you can plug away as much as you like. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> that's great. All right, brilliant. Thanks very much, TJ. That's great. Thank you. Oh, well, well, what can I say about that? Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, TJ, uh, in 
taking the time to talk to me and answer questions from the fans and also with the help and guidance you've given me. Thank you. I really appreciate it and I'm sure the fans will really appreciate having their questions answered. That's all from me, folks, today. So I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed um, talking with TJ. And yes, I shall all see you all soon. Don't forget you can download my app from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, Ramblings of a Hellblazer. Or if you go to iTunes, you can use your own podcast app and search for Ramblings of a Hellblazer and you can access all my previous interviews as well as this one there. Thanks very much, guys. Take it easy. Goodbye.